Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Women in Engineering Chapters webinar, Women Engineering the Future, Session 1. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIEE TV, under the Women in Engineering playlist. This channel is updated regularly, so ensure check back as often as possible for new uploads. And please click on the link that will, be, will, that will appear in the chat box shortly to subscribe to the SI TV channel. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar. I'd like to introduce you now to our host for tonight, Ms. Makola Makololo. She's the chairperson of the Women in Engineering chapter. Ms. Makololo graduated with a Bachelor of Science, Electrical Engineering from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She worked as an electrical system engineer and in various management roles for South African Power Utility, ESCOM, and also worked as a senior reliability engineer for gas giant Sassel. She obtained her MBA from GIPS, University of Pretoria. She is the current Acting Deputy Director General for Energy in the Department of Public Enterprises, DPE, of the South African Government with shareholder oversight on ESCOM, SAFCO, and Alexcor. I hand you over now to Makhola. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Mix. Uh, on a lighter note, I did retire from that role um, recently, so I have a new role now as the Managing Director of Bombardier in South Africa, so more concerned with the manufacturing of locomotives than energy security. Um, well, every, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for this very important um, conversation. Women's Month is a tribute not only to the thousands of women who marched in 1956, but a tribute to pioneers of women who have um, pioneered this movement in South Africa dating back to 1913. We know all the names of the pioneers and we can list them. And all we can say is to uh, salute to them for the role that they have played in ensuring that the voice of women is heard. And the question for this generation is, what will be that one thing that we advance in the, in the struggle for gender equality that will ensure that future generation benefit from our efforts. This year, the government commemorates um, Women's Month under the theme of realizing gender equality, realizing women's right for an equal future. The concept of generation equality is a global campaign and links South Africa to global efforts to achieve gender equality by 2030. We are currently in 2021 and we have to ask the question of, are we doing enough to ensure that we have this, um, uh, uh, this ambition to have a, an equal future in the next nine years. This year, the SIE commemorates Women's Month under the theme of Women Engineering the Future. What does it mean to engineer the future? And most importantly, what does this future look like? And what should we be doing differently as individuals, as a sector, as a profession, to ensure that we have a different future? to ensure that our children don't have to engage on this type of conversation and that having gender equality becomes a norm and that giving women a seat at the table becomes the norm. Tonight, the Women in Engineering chapter leads a conversation with the South African Institute of Engineers to reflect on this conversation, to understand the extent to which we have gone to reflect on, um, to ensure that we influence a different outcome and to ensure that we've got an equitable um, outcome. I would like to introduce the panel for tonight that will um, talk us through uh, this conversation and to help us gain better insight uh, on this conversation. Our first panelist is Tremile Ndombela. She is a plant refurbishment, refurbishment manager at ESCOM. Tremile leads the plant refurbishment team at ESCOM distribution Houghton Cluster, which is tasked to ensure continuous plant improvement to comply with current technological practices, safety standard, and designed operating performance. She's a member of the SIEE and is the immediate past chairperson of the power and energy section. Sevile has a BSc in electrical engineering and, and from the University of Johannesburg. Welcome Sevile and thank you for being part of this conversation. 
Our next panelist is Ms. Michelle Gavinder. Michelle is passionate about leadership in cybersecurity. She leads services and solutions to help business and city strategy as we digitize and leverage the industry 4.0. Michelle is a professional engineer and certified information security manager endorsed by the International Cybersecurity Professional Body. Passionate about risk management, Michelle has achieved a postgraduate diploma at the University of South Africa in applied risk management. An advisor nationally and internationally, Michelle is driving a cyber secure industrial digital business. Welcome, Michelle, to the conversation. Our, our next speaker is Prof. Sunil Maharaj. I think Prof. needs no introduction. Prof. is a full-time professor in the Department of Electrical and Electronic and Computer Engineering and currently the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and IT at the University of Pretoria. He has, he has he has as a combined experience of more than 32 years in industry as a microwave and RF design engineer, academia, and consultant. He holds a BSc in electronic and an MSc, and a BSc and an MSc in electronic engineering, an MSc in operational telecoms, and a PhD in engineering. He's also a professional engineer registered with the Engineering Council of South Africa, a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineering a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and a senior member of the IEEE. He joined SIEE in 1997 and has been a member of SIEE for the past 25 years. The IEEE South African section comes up chapter chair for five years and since 2018, the, chair, the founding chair of the IEEE SA section Vehicular Technological Society chapter. Welcome Prof and thank you so much for being with us. Prof is currently uh, traveling and uh, we'll try and ensure that we've got good visuals, but uh, I think we couldn't get good cam view um, in our preparation session. So to kickstart um, this conversation, I will allow each one of the panelists to give us some insights in terms of how they reflect on what it means for women to engineer the future, to reflect on where have we seen progress, to reflect on where have where where have we seen um, um, a stalling in in progress, and what achievements have been for the SIEE in particular and the various chapter. I'm more fascinated that we also have panelists who are in new um, sectors such as cybersecurity, who can also share with us um, how new industries are being shaped to ensure that we have different outcomes to what we have historically had. So I will give the first opportunity to Prof. Uh, Mar uh, Sunil Maharaj to reflect um, on his own um, outlook on this topic. Prof, the floor is yours. Okay, um, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, our, to the chair, our panelists and uh, attendees. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I'd like to um, uh, salute all the women uh, that uh, are taking part in all the activities that the SAIE uh, has been involved in. And of course, I wish every all the women had a happy Women's Day yesterday. And we commemorate uh, Women's Month. And I think we should commemorate every day uh, for women. Because in South Africa, we know we have the saying, Etin Tembafazi, Etin Tembukodo. I mean, you touch a woman, you touch a rock. And so the women are the pillar of society. I mean, they are mothers, they are guardians, they are our educators, they uh, give us our first piece of education when we're born, and they are, of course, professionals themselves, and they take care of the house and many things. So I think um, we have to continuously uh, have this discourse. It's not only Women's Month, it's that we have a day in South Africa that it kind of uh, shines the light or creates a focus, but I think we need to uh, continue to do that. and. Certainly, I'm very passionate about that. Uh, since the time I took up um, the hero department at University of Pretoria and the deanship, I mean, I always push women in engineering, and we have, I have a special program at University of Pretoria for women in engineering since uh, uh, 2014. Uh, so that's very important to me. And I think uh, I think we have come a long way, but we still got a very long way to go. And you know, as we say, women are 52% of the population in this country. And uh, we don't have that number of females in engineering. And uh, I think uh, we need more engineers in this country, but certainly we need more females. So I think we have come away, but I'm very happy to see that. Um, and I must pay tribute to our immediate past president, uh, Ms. Sai Gura, who basically kind of resuscitated and gave the women in engineering activities at the SARE much impetus. And I'm certainly following from his footsteps. 
and trying to create much more visibility and thanks to the chair for the women engineering uh, chapter that's taking the the baton and running with it uh, and i think we all need to continue to talk about this and how we can engage uh, more women into STEM and particularly engineering and for our case, uh, selfishly into electrical engineering. We still don't have many of them. And I think the biggest bottleneck, if, I look, if you look at the data, for me, the biggest bottleneck is in the schooling system uh, for two reasons. One is, I think career guidance is, is lacking. If you look at some of the information when you speak to some of the grade 12 uh, females uh, or even grade nine or 10 and 11, um, about engineering and especially electrical, they don't know as much as we would like them to know. And the other bottleneck is the, the grades in schooling system because of the schools we have. And if you look at the data, I mean, certainly uh, the number of uh, females that are doing grade, uh, you know, 12 or 10, 11 and 12 maths and science and doing maths and science at uh, the, not the literacy level, at the higher level where they can qualify, uh, that's still quite low. Um, I don't have the data in front of me, but certainly if you look at the previous historical data, the number of students in this country, I mean, if one, almost one million uh, kids enter grade one in school, uh, and we have about five or 600,000 writing grade 12. And of the five, 600,000 that write grade 12, if you look at historically, we have about five to 6,000 only, five to 6,000 of the 600,000 that gets an A in maths and science. And of that, it's even lesser for females. Uh, so this is the challenge we're sitting with, I think, and that's where we need to start. Uh, but SAI plays an important role in terms of uh, mobilizing our students um, among the universities as well. Um, I'll stop there, Chair. I can talk more, but uh, I'll give the others a chance and we'll have a discussion later. Very thought-provoking thought um, opening, um, Prof. Thank you so much for that. Sibile, um, from your perspective, um, where are we as a sector and what should we be reflecting on at this point uh, on this journey? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mahula, for a warm welcome and a great introduction. It is an honor for me to be participating in this event. Uh, for me, for women to even begin engineering the future, it means the right, the need to uh, have equal rights, equal opportunity, and equal access to society. Uh, in order to transform the future, we need to have women in the industry at all levels. So future generations of women can see engineering as inclusive and approachable. It will inspire young women as they see other women lead in this space. So this topic talks to women pushing through the barriers and fighting for inclusion. And when given that opportunity, they shape the future and making the difference. We need to recognize that building a more sustainable world. So am I still audible? Okay. Yes, yes. This topic talks to women pushing through the barriers and fighting for inclusion. And when women are given that opportunity, they are able to shape the future and making a difference. We need to recognize that building more sustainable world will need more female engineers in order to develop inclusive solutions. Women have an important contribution to make in building more equal world. They just need that equal chance to do so. In terms of the progress in the industry, uh, although the positions of leadership, authority, and power are still predominated, predominantly occupied by men, we have seen lately in the industry that in executive positions, women are being appointed. And also, it is encar encouraging to see the stats that indicate that worldwide figures of women studying uh, undergraduate degrees in terms of uh, engineering, they are increasing. So it means when we increase their adversity level, there is hope for future in terms of a uh, number of uh, qualifying uh, female engineers. As at the SAE level, I feel uh, SAE does support women full and effective participation in their structures. I mean, for, the, for an example, this opportunity that we're given today, a platform where we can sit and, as women and exchange views on different uh, topics, it shows that uh, SIE is dedicated into ensuring that it empowers women. 
also look at platforms like a uh, women in engineering uh, society that is specifically created to address issues that women continue to face in the industry all this shows that the SIE has opened its doors and not only opened the discussion about the gender equality, but practically implementing uh, this. I'm also one of the example, um, like they said in the introduction that I'm the immediate chair of Point Energy Section. I was recently given an opportunity to lead in that space. So it shows that a uh, SIE is dedicated in opening opportunities for women to lead uh, in the in their structures. Also, when you look at a uh, council, you see representation of women in all other structures of SIE. You see a huge difference from a uh, couple of years back. Uh, that is my view on that, uh, Mahula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stabile, uh, for that. Uh, Michelle, uh, your views on this? Uh, you are muted, Michelle. All right. Um, the yes. famous line, hey, Mahola, of um, the pandemic. You're on mute. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, to you today and uh, a very warm welcome to everybody. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish every one of us uh, ladies contributing to the engineering fraternity a, um, an awesome Women's Day and Women's Month. And we celebrate and salute you every day, not just in this month, but every day of the year. So thank you and welcome. Speaking to the, the point of women engineering the future, um, it took me some time to think about this and actually reflect on it. And three main points actually came to mind in terms of what that, that would mean. Um, the first being governance and how we, we govern for a secure future. The opportunity and chance to do this and to influence policy and strategic direction is one of the main pillars that we should focus on. And, encompasses engineering the future. This not only from a technical perspective, but from a societal perspective as well. Uh, another key point is our ability to be at the forefront and to lead multidisciplinary teams that are gender inclusive and that put together the pieces of the puzzle that will help shape our future, that will help make us part of the, of the regime and, and the system and be able to influence the generations that come after us. The third element that I thought would be very useful in us discussing today is the ability to build skills that are gender inclusive from a very young age. I think the, the point that you mentioned, Professor Sunil, about the, um, the need for us to take school level children and uh, expose them as well as to look at how we are counseling them from a career perspective is part of the journey of building skills for the future and ensuring that we do so in a gender equal way. Um, you know, part of this could be ensuring that our school, uh, our young girls in school are brave enough, uh, you know, are, are supported and given the opportunities to participate in all sorts of projects that they generally would not at home and are not used to doing and, and participating in. Uh, considering, you know, when we look at, for example, the toys that we're, we're exposing our kids to, um, you know, are, are we being gender inclusive in the way we promote our kids uh, in, in during playtime? And it's, it's just a thought. In terms of what we still need to do, um, we need to be a little bit more intentional with this change uh, by teaching our boy and girl children to support each other so that we have a gender equal society in future and not one that would leave our boy children for example feeling left out but rather for them to to understand that there has been this history where you know we we, we especially in the technical field that we have exposed our boy children more to the field and we've encouraged them with less emphasis on females and as a result of that our female our young uh, girl children for example, are less inclined to participate in this way in, uh, at, when they grow up. With that context in mind and uh, promoting then that girls and boys promote their agenda 
and work towards it. We then create a future that is less, well, I'm hoping, less, uh, more inclusive and um, giving obviously boy and girl children a chance to equally participate. The next question, Mohola, that you did mention and, and ask us about is how are new industries shaping gender inclusivity? I have to say that with emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, um, the field that I'm in, which is cybersecurity, there is plenty of space for, for both male and female participation, leveraging our unique strengths to ensure that we build a future that is technologically advanced that supports our growth as a society that is leveraged to promote um, and to reduce sorry, the, the economic divide that we find not just in our, in our country, but in our continent as a whole, uh, which means that there's plenty of opportunity for us to exploit and come together, build skills and take advantage and improve society as a whole. So some of the new roles that we've seen emerge where females are definitely needed and uh, strong include, for example, data analytics, um, the creation of social, et socially ethical um, uh, solutions with regards to, for example, artificial intelligence and ensuring that we are being socially responsible. We are seeing females um, prove very strong in, in, in this particular area. As well as with cybersecurity, you know, there's a strong element, for example, on um, uh, intelligence and understanding the human psyche, as well as understanding social society as a whole, motivation of threat actors and, um, you know, what are they likely to, to exploit in terms of that, that threat. We think female, um, female engineers in the space be very strong in their contribution to, to finding cyber criminals, for example. So definitely an opportunity for us to all participate in this way. Thanks, Pahala. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists for your, your opening remarks. Very thought provoking uh, um, views. To our audience, please feel free to put your questions in the, in the open poll and we'll take your questions um, towards the end of the session. Um, Prof, you spoke. You spoke a lot. Uh, you opened by by saying, you know, we should make every single day uh, Women's Day. Yet, I think mainstreaming um, gender conversation has become um, uh, difficult. It remains a subject that requires dedicated effort. It remains a subject that requires legislative um, instruments in order for it to be to be enforced. It requires quotas to be enforced. Um, why has uh, this gender mainstreaming? Uh, been so 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 difficult to achieve, and when we talk about um, achieving gender equality by by 2030, we are talking about an environment where we would not need um, to have you know dedicated conversation, and this would become the new normal um, and a society in which we we exist. And you walk into a room, uh, there's just as many men or women um, in 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 a boardroom. Why is gender? Why is you know? Why do you think that gender mainstreaming um, and and mainstreaming this conversation remains so difficult um, for us to achieve? Um, I think as humankind generally. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it comes from our, our, our culture. We live in a patriarchal society, and it comes from the home. I think. Uh, Michelle made a very good point. If you know, we, uh, we are all parents, and if we all can make sure, you know, that we can become the role models and have this kind of discussions at home, where, where our male and female children and our neighbors' children, everybody is treated the same, and given the same opportunity and have the same privileges. Um, I think that's the thing. That's where that feeds eventually into the workplace and uh, and so forth. And that's why I said that Women's Day should be every day and all the time, because we need to continue to talk about it and engage. And sometimes you'll find males may do things, uh, may not be intentional, but unconscious, but maybe because of the upbringing or the way they operated. Um, like sometimes you go in a meeting and all of a sudden maybe the, the secretary is not there and uh, the, the chair who may be a male will say, uh, some female maybe can do, do you mind taking the minutes for the meeting? Not realizing that, you know, as one of my colleagues in the peer in the, in the meeting, and sometimes they do it deliberately, but sometimes they do it unconsciously because this kind of things were ingrained in them. And we need to, you know, um, um, 
erase those things, so to speak, uh, um, uh, and change that perception and change that way of doing things. So that's why we need to continuously involve and engage. And I think the SAI is doing a great job in that. And I think we need to continuously do more of that, um, uh, especially among our colleagues, uh, and also have discussions that what we're having today is, you know, have different leaders in industry talk about their experience and their work and opportunities and how they can engage so that we continuously, so, so to speak, uh, uh, spread the gospel, if I can put it that way, um, going forward. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can talk a lot and give lip service and on occasions like these, and then uh, we all go back to our normal kind of way of doing things. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof, for that. Uh, Michelle, you, you are in a new industry, so cybersecurity. Um, we had a similar conversation about um, renewable energy um, last year. These are new sectors where one would think that um, um, sectors emerging in modern day history where there is a lot more open conversation, where there's a lot more liberties when it comes to gender conversation, that we would see a lot more uh, parity um, in, in, in representation. Um, yet we, we, we don't see a lot of that. And, and I hear you saying um, that the opportunities are there and they exist. But why have these sectors not provided an opportunity for us to leapfrog? You know, uh, because we are all starting from um, from the same base, um, so to speak. Um, why have we not been able to leapfrog um, in this in in these industries? Um, is it a, a function of us once again being caught and prepared as women, um, or what are really the underlying concrete issues um, that have ensured that even in new emerging modern day um, sectors we we we, we remain um, second to male representation? Mm. Very interesting um, a question, Mukhola, mostly because I recently just read a survey of 5,000 working female uh, professionals that were surveyed. And the insight that, that was brought was, you know, one of the questions that was asked was, um, you know, what has been the reason for you to, for example, leave work or to be uh, less present at work? And part of that reason following the COVID-19 pandemic was that a lot of our female professionals, um, you know, had to um, you know, put aside their work commitments in a lot of the cases and take on childbearing activities and responsibilities, um, you know, with a lot of the women being single moms, for example. So that in this year itself has shown us that we've already been at the back foot and not able to leapfrog and kind of take advantage of the opportunities that has presented us with the sudden digital transformation opportunities that have surfaced following the COVID-19 pandemic. What is quite, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, insightful for me was, you know, what what is some of the opportunities that has derived from that, and one definitely being that, you know, with with the um, necess necessary need for us to to uh, take care of our children, you know, what are the different techniques and methods that we can then employ to do such, uh, freeing up obviously time for our professionals, our female professionals, to invest in their skills enhancement. Uh, so that they can take advantage and exploit these opportunities. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Michelle. Stabile, would you would you like to to weigh in on this? Um, I think Michelle spoke earlier about you know technological advancement um, for IR. Um, what should be a different approach to allow for us to get over the incremental changes um, that we have seen over the years and see a leapfrog um, change and, and to really um, get a little bit out of the comfort zone of being okay with, uh, yes, there is progress, but can we leapfrog? Is there an opportunity for that? Is there, you know, are we also blindsided by, by the incremental changes that we've become comfortable with or, or is this the pace that we should all be comfortable with? In the advancement of uh, for, for gender equality. Thank you, Mahula. For me, I think we need to continuously normalize the fact that men and female are equal, normalize that it's normal to have equal opportunities. So for me, mainstreaming includes gender-specific activities and affirmation actions. Uh, I think SIE is doing a great job in terms of uh, mainstreaming gender issues. Uh, they have programs where there are specific interventions uh, to specifically deal with a, a woman in exclusively so that it enables them to participate in and benefit equally from development efforts. 
These are necessary measures designed to combat the direct and indirect consequences of past discrimination. SIE, we've seen it continuously involving women in programs at all levels. So I view this as a strategy for making the contents and experiences of women in an integral part of all discussions so that inequality is not perpetuated. So as they include women at all levels, women get an opportunity to voice their views and also voice their opinion on how uh, they feel in terms of uh, gender inequality. So the more we talk about it, the more we will continue to normalize. So even at our homes, because that's where it begins, we need to teach our girl child, our boy child, that it is normal to have equal opportunities. Thank you, Mahola. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Stabile. Um, I would like to open it up to, to the audience to take a, a few questions so we don't leave it, uh, your questions too late. Uh, Minx, do, do, do you maybe want to put out um, the first question to the panel? Uh, sorry, Makola, there are no questions at the moment. We encourage our attendees to ask questions, which we can okay. have answered by our panelists. Thank you. That's 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 fine. Okay, uh, audience, please feel free to ask uh, questions so we don't leave it to the end and have to cut it short. Um, so 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 maybe Michelle, coming back to you, um, a question about concrete steps. Uh, Prof uh, outlined a number of areas around um, school level interventions. Um, what are the additional um, things that, and, and maybe for the women's chapter, um, um, we should be thinking a lot more about challenging um, um, council on in terms of ensuring that we, you know, we, we've got a uh, more, more, more challenging uh, conversations to ensure that we've got um, different outcomes going forward. Thanks, thanks, Mahola. I think you know the top three that come to mind for me is um, the first one being support of our ladies' participation in the form of in the form of health formation. Uh, you know, something that was brought to my attention the other day was that as 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 females, we are usually risk averse, and we have a way of wanting to have all of the data before we actually take a leap. Um, and I thought that was quite an you know interesting comment to have to have received. Uh, that that being said, I I was in that situation myself, where I had a, a new business offering that I needed to actually roll out, and I myself was was wanting to gather all of the information before taking the leap. Whereas my male um, counterpart, colleague, and friend then advised me, you know what, Michelle, when when I had just sixty percent of this information, I went ahead, um, and then dealt with. Um, you know the impact thereafter, and I think that was that was quite a, a great piece of mentor advice that I received, and uh, I'm I'm just now saying that going forward, that is definitely something that we can do for each other, not just as females to females, but males to females. I think we need to uh, take cognizance of the fact that this is um, how we are, and is as a result of centuries of culture that we're now trying to to change. So. Bearing that in mind, I think that's definitely one of the first steps that we can take. Um, second to that is to uh, build our technical skills. So as females, we usually uh, shy away from this because uh, maybe we, we don't think that we necessarily need to, to, to develop ourselves technically. But what I have seen in the past uh, couple of years, both with myself and with my colleagues who have ventured into different spheres, um, and have branched and taken advantage of the new emerging technologies that and opportunities that come with that is their um, need and kind of um, intention to upskill themselves as and when they had the, the chance to. So I think that's definitely the, the second thing. Uh, the third thing is as senior leaders, be, um, be ready and willing to create a pipeline allowing future female leaders to um, fulfill roles that, they should, uh, that men traditionally did. Um, I think being more intentional about that, preparing our female leaders, and not just exposing them to technical skills, but giving them the opportunity to have the experience. So exposing them to, to experience and, and roles that will allow them to exercise their theoretical skills and knowledge, making them more confident and competent to deliver. Okay, that's very concrete uh, suggestions, uh, Michelle. Thank you for that. Uh, Prof, when you challenged us with the theme for this year, Women Engineering the Future, um, I think it was uh, quite a bit uh, for us to, to reflect on. 
Um, so maybe just to give you an opportunity to, to really challenge us. Um, if we are saying we are, engineer, we are engineering the future, so that, that, that has a connotation of we are not just participants, but we are actively um, shaping and, uh, and giving direction to what the future would look like. So wh what, if you were to challenge uh, the, the women on this call, uh, on this webinar about engineering the future, what are, what are the three key things that you think we should be thinking about in order for us to be actively you know, shaping the future and not, not just participating, but shaping um, that future and ensuring that uh, we are the pioneers and advocates um, of, of that outcome? Okay, I think um, in, in my opening statement, I mentioned that um, you know we have women that, uh, let's say they may be engineers, uh, they are mothers, they uh, maybe sometimes uh, are doing cooking at home, feeding the family, uh, making sure that things happen in the house. Sometimes they even uh, have to arrange uh, the groceries and uh, take care of the kids uh, when they're sick and so forth and even work from home. So um, what I'm trying to say is that women um, do much more multitasking than men. So naturally, um, they are very, very uh, good uh, in terms of leadership, uh, we may not recognize it or appreciate it, but um, I think they naturally are much better leaders than men, uh, given the fact that the way they do things at home. Um, so that's the way I think they are leaders already. Uh, this is how we unleash and manifest that and give it more visibility. And why I say engineering the future, you know, in South Africa particularly, we have the triple, uh, the triple negatives or the challenges we have is poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And as leaders, um, they can help and play a very important role in how we address poverty in terms of innovation, like Michelle said, innovation and uh, and so forth, and uh, becoming technically leaders like yourself, being an MD and how you'll um, create innovation in the company and inculcate a culture of people um, taking risks in a, in, a, in a managed way, but at the same time, uh, creating local um, IP and so forth, and let women take the lead in that space there. And of course, it does the inequality uh, in different ways. And of course, unemployment by innovation, creating jobs. And uh, for me, there's three very important aspects uh, going forward, uh, especially today being, uh, you know, yesterday the report was released by the United Nations in terms of uh, the global warming issue. So for me, um, peace engineering is a very, very important part going forward sustainability because we're busy all of us busy destroying the planet and we're going to destroy ourselves and the planet will still be there but it will destroy humanity and uh, and all the living beings and of course the third one as mentioned is innovation so i think lead uh, ladies can play an important part and that's what called engineering the future is how uh, females as leaders can engineer the future in addressing the triple negatives um, both as leaders in corporate uh, uh, and of course uh, working with each other and sharing uh, best practices uh, and of course uh, supporting each other and even males should support as well but sometimes you know females may find affinity to work with their uh, fellow female colleagues and um, and find um, uh, reassurance from there but i think uh, for me importantly is the school system i, I mentioned uh, about 6000 kids uh, get an a in maths and science that's about only 1% of students that write grade 12 and that's shocking for the country that we want to become an innovation and build economy and from that 1%, I mean, um, I don't have the data in front of me, but certainly, uh, let's say even half of them uh, are females, that's 0.5% or even lesser than that. And even lesser than that are black female kids. Uh, so that's where we need to help each and every one of us, both females and males. And uh, that's where I like to see the SAI get involved, particularly from the women in engineering and the education and training working together is how we can take uh, adopt schools and you know help them and i think um, the chair for uh, uh, for technology and leadership is doing a great job there but i think we all need to support her and galvanize together so that how we can you know take schools and offer career guidance and maybe even assist the teachers uh, with maths and science tuition so that we get more females and students uh, into uh, mathematics and science stem education and even do well in high school so that they come and do engineering particularly because I think if we're going to build a better world we need engineers no one else is going to do it in my view it's engineers and everything we look at it's engineers who do it um, um, so we need them more than anybody else so even in politics we need engineers and we don't have one engineer in politics 
because I think they can play an important role in that. So um, I think those are important things that we need to uh, take cognizance of. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. We we won't tell this to the politicians, <laughs> but I but I absolutely agree. I don't think there's any of of issues we have in our society that lack engineering solutions, and we certainly need to be a, a lot more involved. I think you know, Prof. The, as you mentioned, the statistics. It's interesting that no matter how many times we hear the statistics, they remain shocking um, um, to the system, and and I think you know as we. As, as, as we see progress and there's uh, some of us get a, a seat at the table to be able to engage, you, you know, there can maybe be some kind of um, level of complacency that sets in where you start to think this is the new normal because you find yourself at the table. Uh, Stabila, you spoke a lot, uh, you spoke earlier about um, how the SIE has provided um, uh, you opportunities in terms of, you know, to lead in various facets and, and to advance your knowledge and to be able to influence in this space. Is there a greater demand for those who have had the seat um, uh, to, 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 to do more, um, to act differently and, and, and to create greater spaces for others? And are we doing this um, effectively? If we were to challenge um, each other, are we, are we doing this effectively um, across board? Thank you, Mahula. I think as the people who have already have been given an opportunity to participate in, in these spaces, we need to continuously do engage in mentorship programs, encourage our fellow female engineers to participate in uh, USAE programs. And also, when we are at these programs, ensure that we influence the policies, ensure that policies uh, provide uh, gender-friendly frameworks. For an example, it should include even provision of on-site uh, childcare facilities at work. It is not right that as female engineers, when we need, when we are nursing, we don't even have a private space for, to express for our kids. The only private space, it's shocking that we have to go to the loo for you to be able to express if we are a nursing mom. So we need to continuously uh, challenge uh, the frameworks to ensure that it, it, it includes uh, the needs and the rights of the female uh, engineers. We need to have uh, establishment of career re-entry programs for women who have taken a break to start a family because it's a normal thing so we need to normalize it. Women need to take a break at some point when they need to start a family so it is up to us when we are sitting in the table to influence uh, the policies so that they are inclusive, they also cater for the needs of, of females. We also need to continuously promoting STEM subjects at school levels, targeting younger generation, even at uh, primary schools, especially the project that uh, adopted school projects. I think we should also, all of us engage in those programs, ensure that we motivate kids at younger uh, levels because stereotypes and gender bias, uh, it starts at an early level. So that's where we need to uh, contribute. Uh, that is all for now. Thank you, Mahola. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Sebile. Uh, Minx, can we take some questions from the audience? Yes, uh, thank you, Mahola. We've got a first question from Moiponi Kalaki. What advice would you give an engineering graduate trying to gain experience in the engineering field under the current economic conditions? Hmm. Okay, interesting question. I think we do see a lot of graduates that uh, have not had an opportunity to get uh, a practical experience. Uh, Prof, how do we deal with this problem? I know when I was doing undergrad, you would not graduate um, until you've had your your exposure to industry. Um, what advice would you give um, to, to such persons? Okay, um, the first thing is that I think, um, you know, uh, becoming a student member is not expensive. It's probably uh, depends when you register, maybe over 180 rand a year. And, you know, if you buy a burger and chips and a beer or something, it costs you more than that. So it's, it's not, it's affordable. Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because they could get mentors from our members. Our members are keen to be mentors. It's just a matter of us engaging with them and they can give them guidance, you know, and how they how they help them with the career. And I think our members are um, are very keen to do that. And especially the senior ones, the ones that are close to retirement and things, they're willing to share their experience and the knowledge. I think it's a matter of engaging with them. 
and the other thing is, I think sometimes, um, our, you know, engineers, I believe they can do anything. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because, um, I mean, uh, engineers are needed in everything. And if you look at engineers now, um, for example, Michelle is working in Deloitte as a consulting company. Lots of engineers work in the banking sector, in the fintech area, in the health area. So if you become an engineer, the key thing you learn is about how to think, how to problem solve, how to analyze a problem, and how to find a structured way to address it. And those things can be applied in any sector. So even if you don't get a job in Eskom or in some high-tech uh, company, um, and you're going to get experience, you must go for it because it's still going to teach you some fundamentals and you can apply your knowledge. Because I remember we started the computer at the University of Pretoria, we were the first to start the computer engineering program in this country around 94, 95. And um, um, uh, I was quite surprised that some of our students, the first batch of students, some of them went to work in the banks, um, bank, in the in the banks. And I was, so I asked them, where are you working in? I said, I mean, they said they're working in the bank. I said, what, you studied computer engineering, you struggled for four years, now you're going to work in the bank, and what are you going to do there? Um, and, you know, it just shows that how they could apply the engineering skills, either in software development, or looking at supply chain, or looking at how to address, optimize things, and so forth. So I think you can get experience in any way. I know it may be difficult sometimes, but take the job that you get or the opportunity you get through the internship and use the mentors to help you and guide you in your career. And they can help you and hold your hand, so to speak, or give you advice. And sometimes it can be times can be tough when you're alone and you're sitting on your own and you're a lone ranger and some of you feel only you and nobody else. And that's where our mentors are there. And I think our mentors, um, our members are keen to be there. So, you know, we must exploit that avenue. Uh, thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, maybe Michelle, for you, um, as an engineer working in a consulting environment, um, what, what should fr a fresh graduate, and I guess you have the advantage of having worked in industry before, uh, but for you know fresh graduates out of school that are not able to, to get um, the experience, um, what would your thoughts be? I think this is such a, a great question. So thank you for the question. Um, I think there's two points that uh, I think would, would add some value. The first one being, um, we have many small to medium businesses in South Africa that, for example, do not get the airtime that a global company probably does. And uh, my advice would be to actually look at, so what are some of the engineering structure, for example, as Professor Sunil mentioned, that you could bring to those small um, to medium sized businesses that are looking to, for example, enhance supply chain. Um, one of the uh, key areas that I'm looking at uh, in the emerging technology field is, you know, how do we how do we build and uh, secure uh, sensor-driven um, applications where we're using these um, sensor sensors on the field to extract data, uh, real-time physical data, to help make better operation decisions. Um, and that that is something that is complex and definitely could use engineering skills and knowledge. Um, you know. What, that, that's the one thing. The second thing that we could possibly do is to find problems to solve in your community. I think we, um, you know, we don't play, uh, put enough emphasis on the need for us to apply our skills at a community level. Um, yes, at first it may not reap the fruits uh, of, of uh, financial reward in the beginning, but what it does do is that when you do apply for uh, jobs, it shows that you have taken initiative and that you have already solved complex problems which would immediately put you at the forefront um, when it comes to the recruitment process. Hmm. Right. That's a very interesting point, Michelle. Stabile, would you like to weigh in on this question? Yes, thank you, Mahula. I share the same sentiment as Professor Neil. I think number one, step number one, join SAIE. It will give you a platform for networking. You'll get a mentor then you start in a right footing you get someone who's going to guide you how to uh, move forward you you get to know different uh, people from different industries then you know what suits you well in terms of uh, what you want to do in future also what michelle has said use your skills look around you see the needs and use your skills to, to, to actually solve the problems around you. There are many problems, challenges around us that we can use our skills that we learned at Varsity to solve those problems so that you start on the right footing. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that panelist. Uh, Mings, did we have uh, another question? 
Yes, um, I encourage the attendees to ask questions. Our next question is from Petunia Sile. She's saying, is it not easy to develop current female students into the new fields such as 4IR, robotics, etc.? For most people, it is difficult to change to a totally new field after being in the industry for, say, 15 years. What are the views of the panelists on this? Okay, very, very interesting question. So, are engineers not adaptive in terms of new industries? Um, should we be reliant on fresh graduates into those into into those sectors? Um, Michelle, would you like to weigh in on this first? Sure, Mahola. And uh, I had a feeling that you were going to ask me first. <laughs> <laughs> So I have to say um, it is it is a challenge when you've been uh, in a specific uh, line of engineering for 15 years. But what I've seen happen, and uh, I have many mentors uh, in the field that have not studied cybersecurity, for example, as their primary degree, uh, but studied engineering instead. But what they were able to do, though, is to still provide experience from a pure engineering perspective, which we find extremely useful in securing these same environments. If you look at engineering processes and the fundamental principles behind it, those have not changed much. Uh, what has changed, though, is the tactics and techniques that we adopt um, as we revolutionize our industry. Industry 4.0 Industry 4.0, for example, is an adaptation of what we already know. And while it might seem difficult, it, um, you know, when you actually look at what, are, what is this, these technologies that are helping us get more insight into the plant environment, we see that it's just a you know, simple tweak and um, just a little bit more in terms of the, the skill set that we need to be able to secure those environments. So my, my response and kind of the suggestion would be for, for us to be a little bit more open-minded, to be a little bit more curious into what we could offer. And if experience is, is what you bring, then it is definitely still extremely valuable because like I said, um, the engineering fundamentals and principles still remain. Okay, uh, Prof, your view on, on the question? Yes, thanks, <laughs> good question, <laughs> it's a good question, thank you. So um, I I think um, you know Alvin Toffler said uh, the illiterate of the future would be those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So I think everybody, even if you're close to retirement, you have to unlearn some of the old things and relearn. Uh, for our cybersecurity, maybe learning how to code in Python or whatever the case may be, or writing C sharp or whatever the case is. Um, so you'll have to learn that. I think if you become marketable, but but I think to some extent he. Um, uh, um, People are right that um, the younger one are less uh, or um, are less risk averse, willing to take risks and willing to learn new things. They're very curious, and yes, we must feed that curiosity and, and let them go forward and try new things. But I, I spoke about innovation. I think everybody should be innovative. Innovative means trying new things, mm -hmm. and even trying it and failing. I think in South Africa, uh, we're very risk averse. We don't want to fail because we fail. We get blacklisted. We get looked down by others. And we don't attract, I'm not saying take reckless risks, take risks, but work out and plan it and uh, see how you can mitigate some of the potential risks. Uh, but we must take risks because if you look at it, we'll be successful as an entrepreneur and create jobs and create new industry. I mean, you have to take risks. Um, and a lot of universities in this country have incubators now and are helping students to become uh, entrepreneurs. And that's a great opportunity. So even people that are um, senior in the workplace, um, needs to learn new things so that makes it more marketable and employable. I was very impressed, if I may say this, uh, sorry, I'm taking some time, in Singapore, for example. And Singapore is very successful in technology and learning because it's an island. It has no resources like South Africa and Africa. It just relies on its uh, uh, on its technological capabilities. And with 4IR and new technologies, what they have done is they have given every person, doesn't matter what your age is, given you like a, like a voucher. And the voucher gives you an opportunity you can do any course for so many hours. And the course you can do basically any university or college or wherever it is to learn a new skill and learn a new knowledge that makes you more marketable, helps you in your job. And of course, puts you in the forefront of technology as well. And I found that to be a very great thing that you know that helps uh, people to learn and move forward. And I'm hoping we could do something. I know it's expensive for a population in South Africa, but something we should look at doing as well, even for those that are senior years or maybe those that are unemployed, because I think it'll help 
to equip them uh, for the future as well. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we have to cap it there with, with, with the questions and just to highlight some of the key takeaways that I, I've heard from today and we will really produce an action item as a we chapter just to make sure that we have captured the essence of today's conversation and make it our template for, for engagement uh, within SIE. Um, the first one is that, you know, there's still a lot of work and opportunity for us to do in terms of intake. I think the intake in terms of um, encouraging girls to take up maths and science um, has become a cliche over the years, but, you know, based on what Prof is saying, it's quite clear and evident that there is still need a need for us to help improve the intake, but also to help improve outcomes in terms of uh, um, what kids are able to produce um, at the end of, of, of their early learning phase. Second one I got was around, we must be open to learn and unlearn and be flexible because the world is constantly changing. And if you want to be able to influence the future outcome, we cannot be uh, rigid in what we know and, and, and have learned today. Uh, Michelle made a good point about governing, um, learn to govern for the future and to reflect on how current systems that we have make it difficult for us to adapt and to move forward. Um, there was a point also that was made around mentorship and to be able to get into conversations that assist us to be able to make sense of the world that is changing around us and how we can be adaptive and so that we are able to position and take up opportunities. I would like to give uh, one last minute to all our panelists to have uh, the last say uh, on the subject and any key takeaways that they would like to highlight. Um, I'll start with you, Prof. Okay, thank you. So I want to, um, I want to give three takeaways that uh, I think our members and um, our council members as well and our other members at large uh, should look at. Uh, one of the things I think in the education and training section that at least we should make it our kind of commitment that 50% of the bursaries we give out should be to women. Um, that's something we should look at doing. And then I would like to ask, uh, you know, when we send out our renewal for membership for our members, and uh, maybe we should ask them, listen, would you be keen to sponsor one female uh, university student? Uh, and that's, that's 180 rand or so a year. And uh, I mean, we can ask them, even if uh, 500 people agree from our 5,000 members to sponsor one female mm -hmm. student, that's a big impact because now we can have so many more females as members and hopefully they get an opportunity to meet uh, Makola and all the others and get uh, networking and learning and uh, get exposure. And I think uh, the third one I'd like to see is that um, we should have a program where we offer careers to schools. You know, we should have, uh, we should adopt maybe five or six schools for the year. And even we do one day a year, that's five months. Um, uh, and we can do schools and we offer them career and say why it's important for you to do well in maths and science. Because if you do, if you build the next cell phone, you need to understand mathematics because you need to use FFT, fast Fourier transforms, and why you need to learn maths so that you can do and build your own cell phone of future. So, so that's kind of things I like to leave. And thank you for the opportunity. Okay, very practical um, action items, Prof. We have noted that, I've tapped that down. Michelle? Michelle, are you still there? Okay. I'm still here. <laughs> I, I think for me, uh, the main takeaways um, is, the first one is, you know, we, we've come a long way, uh, yet we, we do acknowledge that we have a far way to go. But something that just popped up into a conversation that I had with my fe uh, fellow uh, female leaders is that, you know, it's, we are trying to change um, what has been centuries of uh, a culture, not just in South Africa, but globally. So bearing that in mind, you know, we, we also need to be aware that it will take time, but in that we're taking um, you know, actionable steps that we are then reflecting on in terms of the effectiveness of those steps. So um, that's the first key takeaway for me. Um, the second one is to look at, you know, creating the change at grassroots levels. Uh, we are all parents and the one thing that we can definitely do, do beginning today is to make gender equality and, and um, you know, the, the fact that we need to change the biases around genders and roles part of our daily family discussions. Uh, and this will definitely see a result, if not in this generation, but in the one that follows. The last one is to be more intentional with the um, membership committees. 
and how we are actually encouraging women to participate in these chapters, not just in the women in engineering chapter, but throughout the sections and chapters within mm -hmm. uh, the Institute. Uh, we have done so much in the last decade, uh, last couple of decades to transform this and our male counterparts and colleagues have been pivotal to that change. Going forward that, though now, um, as female leaders, we need to ensure that we carry on that, that great work. Thanks, Bahala. Thank you for that, Michelle. Very practical advice and suggestions, Gabriela, from yourself. Thank you, Mahula. For me, as a takeaway, I think we need to recognize that engineering skills are the foundation upon which our country development depends on. So we need to make sure that we promote uh, the ski engineering skills, we promote participation of women and girls in science. This means changing mindset and fighting gender bias and stereotypes which limit expectations and professional goals girls have from an early childhood. So from an early age, we need to make sure that we promote STEM, we uh, make sure that the stereotypes, we break them. Uh, our, our girls uh, feel it's normal to do a STEM subject. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to all the panelists. Um, this has been a very insightful um, conversation, a good reflection. Um, I have kept it, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues on, on the call have also kept it some of the action items, which we will um, capture into a report um, and actions that we want to take forward to advance this conversation. So thank you so much. And I think it helps to have you prof on the call. So once you have proposed, uh, we take that as endorsed. We will take it to council for rubber stamping. And uh, so thank you for those suggestions. Very, very, um, uh, um, very good. And I think could be very effective. To our audience that's in attendance, we'd like to thank you so much. And I think if you've got further suggestions, please please do feel free to drop them with me or with Ming, so any of the ladies in the women's chapter. And lastly, I would like to thank my colleagues in the women's chapter for conceptualizing this event and to ensuring that it's a success today. And hopefully we are saving um, our constituencies um, adequately. Thank you so much for this and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. Bye-bye.